Uh, again, I want to take you to, I'm going to jump around a little bit. We're going to start in Esther chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Then we'll jump to Esther's chapter 8, verses 12 through 15. Verse 12 of Esther 3. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and Edic, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and to the governors all of over all the provinces and to the kings of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written... In the name of King Osarius and sealed with the king's signet, signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Esther's chapter 8, verse 12. And on one day throughout all the provinces of King Ohesaurus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, a copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all peoples, and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies." So the couriers mounted on their swift horses. They were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command. And the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your kindness, and for all that you are unto us. We ask now that you give us a word that would bless your people, penetrate their hearts, minds, and souls, that it will build us up and bring us closer to the image that you made us before we fail. Lord, we're all about your kingdom and moving your kingdom forward. So use us under the anointing and the power of your Holy Spirit, and we'll forever give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Somebody say, thank God. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord and Savior. I need you to understand the context of the scriptures that I have read on today. Esther is a very powerful, um, powerful uh, uh, text, and I want to give as much as I can to you guys on today. Y'all time me today. I'm going to do my best to stay on time today. Uh, uh, but, but Esther is a powerful, powerful uh, um, book. Um, that you never see the word God in this book the entire time. But we know this is a godly book. And so what I want to do is paint a picture for you of what's going on. Esther's uh, is, again, a book that's caught in a time where it is the Jewish dysphoria, which means the Jews have been dispersed in among nations. They have been brought into enslavement. And Esther and the people of the Jews at this time are currently in the Persian Empire by King Osarius, or you would know him as King Xerxes. For some of y'all that watched 300, you remember that movie 300? Uh, there was King Xerxes in there. That, that's the king that they're talking about here in the movie 300, for those of you that want to have a connection. All right? And so what has taken place is that Haman is an individual within this kingdom that is an Agite, or he's from, uh, from the lineage of King Agag, which is an Amalekite, and I'm going to come back to that in a second, um, and he has been promoted to the second highest position in the entire nation, in the entire country, in the entire kingdom. And so what he wants, as most people in position of high authority, especially in kingdoms, he is looking to be honored as he travels through the cities or he walks through uh, 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 the, 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 the highways and, and the uh, streets. And there's a conflict that arises because Mordecai, everybody bows down to Haman when he walks by, but Mordecai refuses to bow. So Haman is walking by, and Mordecai continues to stand. And Haman gets so disturbed and so upset that this man would um, not bow down before him. It becomes a hatred that Haman has 
for Mordecai. It is so bad that it doesn't matter how many times Haman is blessed throughout the scripture. I don't have time to go through all of Esther. Go back and read it. It's a short read, but a good one. Um, but he, there's examples of he gets promoted and he gets even more blessings. But when he walks by and sees Mordecai not bowing before him, then he goes home. And the only thing he can think about is this man that refuses to honor him. So he develops hatred for Mordecai to the point that he wants Mordecai and all Mordecai's people, the Jews, to be killed. So Haman devises a plan to present to the king unknowingly. The king doesn't know what's really happened, but a law that is put in place that on a certain day, the last day of the year, on the 13th day, that the people of all the nation and all the country from the rural to the suburban areas to the urban areas, from the cities to the towns, they on that 13th day, they all could take up arms to kill the Jewish minority. Ooh, geez, I'm going somewhere. Stay with me today. In other words, Haman devises a plan of massive genocide. Massive genocide. And theologians argue on what is the reason why Mordecai does not bow down to Haman. The first argument is that there is a theolo theological conflict. In other words, there's a conflict between who he is and what Mordecai believes as being a believer of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Haman. Uh, Haman is maybe seen as one that is either wearing something that is adulterous or he is doing something that's adulterous or he himself thinks that he's a god, which is why he wants people to walk down and bow to him. Now, do understand there was nothing wrong with the bowing down because you will find other scriptures that men of God bow down to leaders that were not spiritual leaders or, 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 or to their king. So the, the bowing down wasn't the issue. The issue became for Mordecai possibly is because what we saw was somebody trying to propagate himself as a deity. And so because of that, Mordecai refused to bow down to him. The second other uh, uh, potential conflict is an ethnic conflict. All right. Uh, an ethnic conflict exists between them because there is history between the Jewish people and the Alchemalites. All right. We go all the way back to Moses' time. We see that these, these um, Akimalites attacked the Jewish people when they were weary and faint, and they were the first people to attack them for no reason. And so then there was a battle that takes place. Many of you know this battle where Joshua is fighting in the wilderness, these Akimalites, and as long as Moses' hands are up, they win the battle, and they're able to win the battle because Moses' hands stand up. Side note, this is a spiritual thing that is happening. I need you to understand it's a spiritual thing that's happening because that was really a spiritual battle being propagated in the natural. Another example we see of these Akimalites is when King Saul is told by God, because those people did my people wrong in the wilderness and they are evil and wicked, they all need to be massively destroyed. He tells King Saul to destroy all the Akimalites. If you go back to the scripture, it says, tell, kill the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, all of them. Destroy their cow, destroy Frisco, destroy Tito, destroy the cows, destroy Mr. Ed, destroy everything of them. And don't take none of their property or none of their money. Destroy everything of the Akimalites. We find that these same Akimalites are the ones when David was on the run and he lived in Ziglag, which was a Philistine town, that him and his men all lived there and all their family and all their children and everything he had was there. They go off to war to help the Philistines and the Akimalites come to Ziklag while there's no men there and with cruelty to enslave and take all the men, men, men I mean the women, the children, and everything that, that, that David and his men had. The Bible says when David and his men returned, they returned and they cried until they couldn't cry anymore. This same Acumen lights, there's a man that when Saul was getting ready to die in battle and Saul was falling on his sword, Saul told the uh, uh, young Acumen why don't you um, help me kill myself because I don't want my enemy to kill him. And this Acumen -like young man comes to David as if he's going to be recognized and honored for killing the king of Israel and David is offended because he's an acronym like and who told you to touch God's anointed so there's history between them that may have brought Mordecai to the point to say I will not bow down to an acronym who is a arch enemy against the people 
of God. To bow down to him is to bow down to sin, to bow down to evil, to bow down to wickedness. In other words, what exists here is a situation where Haman again gets angry and commits, wants to commit Jew, genocide, a day where all the Jews are killed. Y'all hold on, I'm going somewhere today. This is a word that I want you to capture. And, and, and so what happens is, the best example I can give you in today's time is the movie's Purge. How many of y'all have seen The Purge? Any of those movies? Yeah, y'all need to be saved. That's all right, I love you, watching that demonic stuff. But it's okay. Uh, 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 you're here today. Uh, uh, but The Purge is a dystopia, all right? What a dystopia is, is that it's an example of an environment or an ideal society that is built upon oppression, wickedness, violence, poverty, and ultimate destruction. In the purge, they're giving 12 hours, in other words, the entire night, to go kill anybody they want to kill and commit any crime that they want to commit. They're giving one day, 12 hours, to do this. Sounds like this scripture here. They're giving one day to kill the Jews. All right? Well, y'all say, Pastor, where are you going today? Well, I want to talk to you, I want to submit to you the subject of my message today is how to have a utopian society. A utopian society. What is a utopian society? A utopian society is a society that's near perfect, and it is where everybody has equity and everybody is moving in the right direction. There is very little to no poverty. There doesn't exist any prejudice or discrimination. There doesn't exist any of the systematic oppression that may exist in regular societies. And, and I want to talk to you about this uh, 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 this, uh, this uh, utopian place or existence because I want to draw from the parallels of what's going on in Esther to what's going on in the society we live in in America. Oh, I need you to understand this society is far from per perfect. While there isn't a mass violence that are, uh, that's taking place uh, uh, right now in one day specifically, there are laws and systems put into pla place to provoke, enable, and ensure that violence does take place upon the minorities of this country. Like the Jews in our text who were minorities in the Persian nation, both black, brown, and natives have and are suffering due to the hatred that exists in our country. These delusion feelings have for way too long been free to be expressed in the laws, the amendments, and the systems that exist in the country that we live in today. Now, you must understand the word of the Lord has, that I'm given today is one that I don't take lightly. Because if you know anything about me, I don't preach because of what, just what's happening in society or what the light, latest trend is. I don't preach out of my whatever implicit biases that I may have. I'm not one to just preach on something because something's happening. It's simply put, I must be inspired by God to preach anything that I preach. And I hold myself to the integrity to make sure whatever I bring before you is something that is given by God. Well, today is one of those days that God has called me to give a word to bring about a truth and bring people to a greater knowledge so that we can see what God can do when you let him be involved. If y'all if y'all praying for me, say, Pastor, we're praying for you. Yeah, yeah, this is live and this is something that can be controversial for some, but I got to do what God's told me to do. If there's anybody crying out for God, I got to cry out for God for myself. So I want to deal with that. I want to speak to you about a utopian society. Uh, most people, if you reach and research utopian societies, they say it's no possible way that they could ever exist because you're talking about things being near perfect. You're talking about things being 100% where they need to be, and these societies probably more than likely could never exist. But I need you to understand, I believe by the God and the Holy Spirit that God is trying to do some things in our society to bring us to another place. And I need you to understand that there are still yet demonic forces that are working against the plan God has for all mankind. Y'all not hearing me. I need you to understand that God is trying to do something supernatural, but I need you to understand that God is looking to do a movement, not a moment. Oh, I, I, I need you to understand God wants to do something that is permanent, not something that is temporary. And I need you to understand through the scripture we see today, we can see how you can bring yourself to a utopian society. And it won't happen just because. 
it's got to happen because God is involved. And I, I, I need you to understand, I'm going to end with that point. But before I get there, let me show you some keys if you're going to have a utopian society. The first thing that you mu there must be for a utopian society, somebody say there must be a righteous cause. There must be a righteous cause. I need you to understand, I, I'm going to emphasize, there must be a righteous cause. Uh, in the scripture that we read today, we find a situation where innocent people, the minorities of this nation, nation of this kingdom, were going to be killed because of the hatred that one man had for another man. Because he would not submit to his deity-ness that he thought he had. Because he would not go along with the plan. Y'all not hearing me this morning. Because he wouldn't just submit to what was wrong. It caused a conflict. And that conflict permeated to the point to where now innocent people were going to be. Ooh, Jesus, I'm preaching this morning. And I need you to understand, innocence is always a righteous cause. Saving innocent people is always a righteous cause. Cause, if you believe that, say amen. Yeah, I need you to understand that, that there are many innocent people that have died in this country. Uh, there's many, many innocent people that had nothing to do with the situation but were killed because of hatred, killed because of discrimination, killed because of naiveness, killed because of ignorance, killed because of wickedness. Oh, and God is a God that looks at innocent blood. Y'all don't believe me. The Bible says when Cain killed Abel, God came and talked to Cain. Where is your brother Abel? Because his blood cries up at me. God always deals with, he may not come when you want him, but somebody said he's right on time. God will not allow innocent blood to just take place. God will get involved with innocent blood. Now, it may not happen when you want to, but I need you to understand that God will bring it to pass. There must be a righteous cause. There must be a reason upon which we are seeing uh, 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 God working and God getting involved. We see right here in the situation, Exodus 3, 8 and 9, where Haman makes a plan. He tells the king, there are people that don't believe like you, that don't operate like you. He gets in the king's ear and he tells them, he tells him, listen, I will, let's write a law. Oh, Jesus, I need you to understand this. Let's put a law in place that on the 13th day of the last month, that we can kill all these people in the nation. And then he said, I'll put some money behind it. I'll put $3 million behind it to fund it. Oh, y'all not, y'all ain't heard, y'all ain't heard what I'm saying. I, in other words, I will, I will put the finances behind to put in institutional laws that make it legal to kill innocent people. Ooh, Jesus, I'm trying to help you this morning. I know, I know some people might not get this, but I need you to catch what God is saying this morning. And, and so the, the law was put in place, and I need you to understand something about Persian law. Once it has been written and the king has put his ring of signet ring on it, it cannot be reversed. It can't be reversed which means that 13th day of the 12th month, even though it was the first month, the death, the dead, the writing was on the wall for the Jewish people. They were going to be attacked by all the different provinces, all the different people of that region, of that area. Wherever you live, you are not going to be able to hide if you were a Jew. How devastating is it when a law is put in place to, to hold you down? How devastating is it when a law is put in place to ultimately kill you? How devastating when it's a law that's put in, put in place when it's become systematically designed to destroy you? Oh, I feel like one of them old preachers. You ain't got to say, man, I brought my gas money with me. Oh, if you're going to have a utopian society, there must be a righteous call. The second thing, there must be key influencers. There must be key influencers. It's key influencers that help bring about a utopian society. Oh, I'm trying to help you. Um, Esther is the first type of influencer. She's the type that uh, th those are the ones that have healthy relationships with decision makers. Oh, y'all ain't caught this yet. Esther is one that had a healthy relationship with the king. Some of you may be put in place because you know how to get along with other cultures 
Oh, y'all, and other ethnics. All right. Some of y'all are not Esthers. Uh, and that's okay. But some of y'all think on a level that's beyond just the color of your skin. Uh, are you you're not hearing me? And, and, and God has put you in key influential areas to bring about a change. Oh, y'all not hearing me this morning. And so Esther represents the type of influencers that have healthy relationships. I need you to understand that there's no way that the Jewish people get back to their homeland to rebuild the walls if there was no Nehemiah and Ezra. Both had healthy relationships with a pagan king that didn't honor their God, but honored their God because of them. And some of you are missing how God can move because you are fighting instead of building healthy relationships. You can't be so implicitly biased in who you think you are that you miss the opportunity to build. Oh, y'all not hearing me. Oh, can I put it in plain English? Not every cop is evil. Oh, not every government official has hatred. Y'all not hearing me. Not everybody that's not the color of your skin, your skin has means evil against you. And you got to have a better perspective than that to understand there are relationships that are key to utopian societies. Oh, I'm preaching this morning. Oh, you can ask Martin Luther King Jr. He had those on both sides that were key to him being able to go forward. He was able to develop healthy relationships, and some of us have healthy relationships. And here's, here's what you need to understand. Some of you don't realize you are in that position, and God put you in that position. Here's a sign that you may not realize it. It's because initially Esther didn't want to get in the fight. Ooh, I said something right there. Initially, Esther didn't think that it was her responsibility to influence the situation. Now, she wanted to take care of her uncle, Mordecai. She made sure when she heard that he was distressed and he was going through, once he heard the law, the Bible says Mordecai ripped up his clothes. He was in sackcloth and ashes, and he just stood at the gate. He would not be uh, um, uh, helped. He would not be made to feel well because his people were in a stressful situation. And Esther was in, the, in, in her place chilling with her AC and her mango juice. Yeah, yeah, her cherry limeade. Yeah, yeah, her, ch her cherry cheesecake, she was chilling. She sent him some nice clothes to get back up, but she wasn't trying to get in the fight initially until she was made enlightened of how important it was for her to be in the fight. And the reason she was, is where she was is to impact the movement forward of God's people. Oh, Jesus, I'm trying to help. There's another type of influencer, which is Mordecai. Mordecai is the type of influencer that has significantly or often benefits the decision makers. I'll say it again. Some of you are are Mordecai's. The text says earlier in the scripture, I don't have time to go back, but, but Mordecai basically saves the king's life because the king had two eunuchs that had planned to kill him. Mordecai heard of the plan and alerted the king's officials, thus getting those, man's kill, those men killed and saving the king's life. So what happens is Mordecai becomes a benefit to the decision maker. Some of you are the ones that benefit the decision makers in the earth. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying? I need you to catch this. But the problem is you won't do right because right is right to do. You only do right because you feel like it. Oh, but I got educators in the room. Some of y'all are teaching the kids that's going to help pass laws to change things in this country. And depending on how you treat them when they were vulnerable, y'all not hearing me, how you treat people when they're vulnerable when it's in your hands to do right, when it's in your hands to show godliness, this impacts decision makers down the line. I'm preaching this morning. I need you to hear this. So, so, so I need you to understand there need to be some key influencers. Tell your neighbor, I'm a key influencer. There, there, if you're going to bring about a utopian society, if you're going to bring around a, a, a radical change, there must be some key influencers. Number three, there must be a systematic strategy. There must be a systematic strategy. In other words, you got to just stop talking loud and have a plan after you get stop being emotional. Many of us want to be emotional, but we have no plan to cause change. Many of us 
want to talk about it, but we're not being what? About it. Many of us, because we got AC, and we got nice cars, and we got a job, and it don't impact our day-to-day, we good. Ooh, Jesus. Oh, uh, 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 let me put it like this. So, so, so I said many of us. Let me say all of us have had times where we should have stepped forward and we didn't because we were comfortable uh, on whatever dynamic in your life. But I need you to understand there must be a systematic strategy. Listen what happened. Esther goes to the king, and the king tells her, what is it that you want, Esther, and I will give you up to half of the kingdom. Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of the kingdom. But Esther doesn't get, tell him directly what she wants right then. She says, I want you to come to this banquet, you and Haman. Oh, y'all see, the problem is y'all don't want to feed y'all enemies. Oh, y'all, 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 y'all want to just make sure that there's a natural divide. See, you, you, the Bible says be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. So sometimes you got to use wisdom. You can't always go shooting and arguing. And sometimes you got to learn to do wisdom to bring about things. Why? Because while you yelling, somebody behind the line, behind is typing something. And by the time you get done yelling, there has already been a notification gone to remove you from the um, job. Oh, y'all see, see, you got to understand when you get in a conflict, if your means is to get emotional and talk crazy, the other person may not talk crazy to you, but it don't mean they ain't got a plan. Oh, and behind the scenes, there's a plan being working on you, and you wonder why you ain't got a raise in a year. Because it was, oh, y'all, somebody talked to the decision maker before you did. Ooh, I'm trying to help y'all this morning. But I need you to understand, so Esther devised a plan. I want you to come to this banquet. I want to, I want to, because I need you to understand, in order to make change, you must pr- be in a situation where you can be heard and received. Oh, tell your neighbor, I need to be heard and received. Because I need you to understand, you can be heard. I, I, I got nothing against a protest. I got nothing against a boycott. I got nothing against standing out and being heard. But, but, but you got to be heard and received. See, heard means that you just speak loud and, and, and whoever is there can listen. But received means you have created a setting by which there's an environment that what you're trying to propose can be heard by the person that you need to hear it. So she creates an environment, she puts this banquet in place. This banquet brings about joy. Because y'all, see, y'all, you need to read the scripture. When we first find King Osirius in the beginning, he's partying. Woo, I'm preaching right now. He's partying right, right then. And he parties kind of crazy because that's how he lost his first wife. His first wife said, you ain't about to embarrass me. She, he said, I'm getting rid of you. I'm going to get another one. All right? And long story short, I ain't got time to go in it. But we find early in the scripture that he's partying. So what does... Esther do, she creates another party for him. Do you know how to bring decision makers into a place where they'll receive you? You create an environment that they enjoy. Y'all ain't caught it yet. See, some of y'all want to go to your boss and sit down and give your 10 points of what need to change. But you don't know your boss like Pepsi. And if you would have brought that Pepsi drink first and then came back the next day, they would have listened to you better. But because you just want to go in there with your demands, they ought to listen to me. You need to learn to use wisdom. She created an environment to where the king would really receive and listen to what she had to say. And she understood that. Here's the other part. Now, I need you to understand it's not enough just to create an environment. It's not enough to be, be heard. But I need you to understand great changes happen and things happen when you put it in writing. Yeah, yeah. Um, The the Bible says, in all thy getting, get an understanding. I know a pastor here in the Metroplex that says, in all thy getting, get a contract. Because how many of us have had somebody do something for us and we made a verbal agreement and they didn't live up to the verbal agreement and you had no ways of recourse because you didn't sign anything? Matter of fact, you got to do this in your, sometimes you got to do this in your, uh, uh, in your, uh, your marriage. Put it in a text message so you both can't forget what you agreed upon. Y'all ain't heard me. Yeah, because I'll say one thing and do 
another, and then be like, I don't remember that. Oh, y'all, that y'all, okay. All right, so, 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 so you got to put it in writing. And, and so what happens is the systematic strategy was to be received and heard. Esther had a plan that I need him to hear me and receive me because my whole people are getting ready to be killed because you unknowingly wrote a law that has brought about systematic genocide. Oh, Jesus, I'm preaching this morning. So, so I need you to write another law. What happens is you got to understand, I said earlier, with the Persian Empire, you once the king signs a law, it cannot be reversed. So the only thing that can be changed is you have to write another law. Y'all ain't caught that today. Y'all ain't caught that today. I need you to understand. In other words, if our society is going to change, there's got to be some laws written. We can do all this talking. Listen, uh, we, we are past the phase of awareness. We are aware in 2016. We wore I Can't Breathe shirts in 2016. Now I need you to put some stuff in writing. Yeah, yeah, I need you to put some stuff in writing so that because people respect laws. Yeah, yeah, in other words, we need a movement, not a moment. We, so some of us are caught up in the moment. And if you're caught up in the moment in the emotional thing, as soon as the basketball starts J July 30th, because I'm going to be watching like everybody else, you're going to forget about everything that's happened. When July 30th happened, I didn't forgot about COVID. Y'all not hearing me. I, I, you, I need, all of us naturally going to forget. Which is why you got to put things in writing. Laws have to be made to protect people that are dying innocently. Laws have to be enacted to, to undo what has been done. Woo. It is time to undo what has been done. You can no longer just go at things, just go at them how you want to. You must go at them systematically. So they put it in writing. Remember, on the 13th day, Haman had it put in writing that everybody could go kill the Jews in their area. So there was another law put in writing on the 13th day of the last month that all Jews can defend themselves from anybody trying to kill them. Now, I need you to understand something. I am not pushing violence. Be very clear. We're not talking about violence. We're talking about principle. We're talking about making sure things are reversed and equity is put in place so you just can't do something to me and I can't defend myself. You can't just destroy me and I don't have a way to build, build back up. You can't just kill my family for generations and I ain't got a way to build my family back up. You can't keep putting my, my men in jail and I ain't got a way to get them out. Y'all not hearing me. You can't keep messing up the families by taking the fathers out. I got to be able to bring the fathers back. You can't keep just destroying my the society. Oh, there's got to be a change that's coming. We're no longer fighting the old way. We're going to be systematic because it's time to reverse what has been done. Oh, y'all, I need you to hear me. Uh, I need, we got to reverse some amendments. Oh, the 13th Amendment, go do your research. The 13th Amendment uh, basically allows for slavery to still be illegal because if you're convicted of a felony, I can put you in jail. And if I put you in jail, you'll be down in Mississippi still picking cotton. Y'all not hearing me today. But God is about to bring about a change. Woo. Oh, in the favorite, in the famous, one of my favorite singers who is amazing, uh, uh, and Sam Cook 101, that ain't no scripture, but he said, it's been a long time coming, but uh, change going to come. Y'all not hearing me today. You got to get it in writing. The, the last thing that I want to emphasize to you is that out of everything I talked about, it's great. And this is the last misstep that most people miss. This is why any movement right now will fail if it does not have this last step. I need you to understand. Let me be in plain English. I am so proud to be a black man. Oh, it, I, wear this, I wear this good. Oh, I look good. I don't know, I don't know what y'all talking about. I look, when I look in the mirror, I say, you look good. Boy, you fly. But I'm, more importantly than being a black man is I'm a believer of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Which means everything that I do can't be exempt of him. Every decision that I make must be guided by him. So though I might feel a certain way as a black American, I must align that up to God's word as I'm going to go forward in life. Because if I don't, I'll miss God working in what I'm trying to do. So if you're going to have a utopian society, the most important thing, which is the last thing I'm talking about today, there must be divine involvement. There must be divine 
involvement. Oh, Jesus. The Bible says Mordecai goes to Esther and says, Esther, don't think, and I'm paraphrasing, don't think that you will be saved when this thing go down. That you and your father's going to be saved. And I ain't got time to dig deep into this before some of y'all can catch this. Uh, uh, you'll catch this. Don't, Esther, don't think you're going to be saved because you're in the, in the king's house. Y- y'all ain't caught that. But, 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 but here's the text that messes me up. It says here uh, in Esther chapter 3, verse 14, for if you keep silent at this time, listen to this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. I need you to understand whether you participate or not in what God's trying to do. God will bring relief and deliverance from another place. Now, it's supposed to come through you. Oh, Jesus. Now, what threw me off is why does does Mordecai say this? Why does he tell Esther that relief and deliverance will rise from another place? If you don't, key influencer, Use your God-given position and ability to cause change on your level. God's deliverance and relief will happen for another place. What makes Mordecai so confident in this? It blew my mind. I'm listening at this text, and and I'm like, where does Mordecai get this from? And then I begin to study, and I, I realize that that, that Mordecai's thesis was derived from his analysis and, succinth- and synthesis of proper exegesis. I'm okay, I'm going to say that again. Y'all ain't caught that. Mordecai's thesis was derived from his analysis and synthesis of proper scriptural exegesis. Oh, okay. In another word, Mordecai's proclamation comes from his detailed examination combined with his present situation after clearly, it, clearly having the right interpretation of God's word. Okay, they didn't work. In plain English, he had studied God's word enough to know that God promised he would never let his people be utterly destroyed. And you've got to know that no matter the challenges that come in your life, no matter what's happening in society, God's not going to let you be utterly destroyed. God promises to bring deliverance. God promises to bring victory. God promises to bring healing. God promises to bring freedom in Jesus' name. Oh, y'all don't believe me. Can I suggest you in Deuteronomy? uh, Can I suggest or interest you in Deuteronomy 31.6? Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doeth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Oh, that wasn't good for you. Can I interest you in Psalms 34, 7? The angel of the Lord encamps around all them that fear the Lord and delivers them. Okay, that didn't help you. Maybe I can interest you in 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of all of them. Okay, finally, Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. Mordecai understood. Ooh. Through God's word that he will never leave his people forsaken nor begging bread. That he will always provide a way of escape to those that believe God. So I need you to understand it's not enough for your ethnic to exist. You must be a believer in Christ so that deliverance will come from another place. Oh, y'all not hearing me. God has promised to bring relief and deliverance to your situation. But it's not going to happen just because it's going to take divine involvement to bring about the change in society. We can try to do all we want to do, but if God ain't involved, and it won't last. If God don't get in it, it won't last. If God is not first, if God is not the center, then you just run spinning your wheels and wasting your time. But when God is in it, woo, there's a song that says, there is no limit. Oh, Jesus, if you hear me, just give God some praise in this place. Oh, I come to shatter some mindsets this morning. 
I come, I come to put, bring a sword between mentalities for some of you that are so pro this that you are missing God and some of you that are so anti that that you are missing God as well. Oh, this is not the time to be neutral. This is a time to stand on the right side of the Lord uh, in the way that God has called you. This is a time to reevaluate why you in the Esther position that you're in. It's the time for you to reevaluate why you're in the Mordecai position that you're in because we're not fighting for just your life. There's just generations coming after you that you're supposed to leave it better oh for them than it was when you got it somebody say pass the baton one of the worst things you can do in a relay is to have a bad pass off of the baton worst thing you can do that that time and who ran track in here other than me oh, oh you know that timing got to be on point because you're running into a situation that the person in front of you, oh, oh my good Holy Ghost, this ain't no none of the stuff God was gonna give me today. But but you but you're running with the person in front of you that their job is to start running immediately and reach out and not look back. They're trusting on you that you can give a good handoff because they don't have time to look back. To look back takes seconds off the run. To look back can cost me the race. To look back deters me from my form. I don't have time to look back, so I need a good handoff. And we, the present generation, it's our job to give a good handoff. Oh, it don't matter if you're a teacher, a cop, a principal, or a, a construction worker. It don't matter if you're a doctor or a mechanic. It don't matter if you work sales or customer service. It don't matter if you work in a bank or you work in a grocery store. It's your job to give a good handoff. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I need you to understand that, that divine involvement must be, be present in everything we do. But here's the other thing. The Bible says that Esther, after her uncle woke her up and she understood she wasn't going to be saved just because she was the queen, but that this thing was going hit, to hit her, she wasn't going to escape it. And some of us think we're going to escape the discrimination and the prejudice and things that happen to us. Oh, you might get, get grazed by, but I promise you, somebody in your family, somebody in your heritage, somebody going to be impacted by your lack of getting involved in the race. Oh, so Esther says, have everybody in the nation go on a three-day fast. Don't eat nothing. Don't drink nothing. Oh, oh, what am I saying? Because even though God is involved, you should still seek his involvement. You know, I've been hearing people say it's time out for praying and we got to have action. Oh, I'm tired of the praying. That's all the churches want to do is pray. I, I, I just grew up on songs that said prayer changes things. So whatever we're trying to do, we need to make sure that we seek God's involvement. You should be praying more now than you ever have before because this is a time for God to make pivotal change. But we can miss the timing if God is not involved. It's not enough to organize if God is not the organ. Oh, y'all not hearing me. It's not enough to have an organization if God is not the OR in the organization. It's not enough to just do what you're doing if God is not involved. You got to seek his involvement. In all our ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. In all our ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. We, if we're going to see societal change, it must be with God being involved. Long story short, they go through all this, and the law is written, and there's two last things that I'm going to give to you real quick because it is so powerful, and some of y'all going to shout when I read this, when you catch this. Esther of 8, 5, 15, 8, 15, listen to this, 8, 15. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. Y'all didn't shout yet. I'm going to read it again. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white with a golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. Oh, y'all ain't caught. Uh, then Mordecai, because I think God's saying prophetically for something uh, for us to catch in the spirit. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white. Oh, y'all ain't caught that. All right. Uh, and with the golden crown of robe, fine linen, and purple, and the city of Susan shouted and rejoiced. I'm going to read it one more time. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white. 
Oh, y'all, okay, that's all right. What am I trying to say? So, so here's the thing. Our, our flag is red, white, and blue and white. But see, when God was showing me this, I was saying, God, I get you, but, 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 but it don't work all the way because, because there's a purple there. He went out, he was draped in purple, white, and blue. And God spoke back to me because the, ro- the, the purple represents the royalty of the person that they represent royalty. And so I need you to understand that the flag that you need to wear is a purple, white, and blue because the purple represents Jesus. Oh, in other words, if God is not involved in your patriotism, if God is not involved in what you wear, if you are not walking in the colors of the true and living God, whatever you try to do won't become a reality. But when you walk in the authority of God, when you walk in the presence of God, that's when you guarantee the divine involvement and change. If you hear me this morning, give God some praise. Let us stand. Let us stand. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, this.